So, okay, I think uh, we're ready to start. First of all, I would like to thank uh, you all for joining today's webinar on the impacts of uh, public sector food procurement strategies and tools for better management. My name is Carlos Amundancia. I'm a communications manager at UFIC, and I'm also involved in the communications activities of the Strength to Food project. So to start, I'm very happy and excited also to announce that we've reached 305 registrations. Uh, so there seems to be a huge interest in the topic. Uh, and we are very happy, again, like I said before, to count with all of you today. Before I give the word to Matthew Gordon, our Strength to Food Projects Coordinator, I would like to point out a few things. So the first thing is that the presentation is being recorded. Our idea is to share them with all of you once the event is completed and it has finalized. The second, due to the high attendance that we expect for this event, we would appreciate if instead of uh, raising your hand, you submit all your questions via the Q&A tab. Uh, this way, we can make sure that even if we are not able to answer your question today, we still can address it on the Q&A that we will send together with the recording of the, of the webinar. And the last thing, so once you see people submitting questions, you can also outvote this question. And the more likes they get, the more chances they have of being addressed during the Q&A session at the end of the event. And now I would give the word to uh, our project coordinator, Matthew Gordon. Thanks, Carlos. Good morning, everyone. Welcome. So Strength to Food is a five-year EU Horizon 2020 project looking at uh, food quality schemes, public sector food procurement, and short food supply chains. Now, today we're going to focus on public sector food procurement. And this is very timely. Last week, the European Commission published the Farm to Fork strategy, and that included the draft action plan with commitments, and I'll just quote, to determine the best modalities for setting minimum mandatory criteria for sustainable food procurement to promote healthy and sustainable diets, including organic products in schools and public institutions, as well as a requirement for the food industry to integrate sustainability into corporate strategy and an EU level targets for food waste reduction. Now the work which we've been doing on public sector food procurement cuts to the heart of these issues. So first of all we're going to hear from Professor Angela Trigia who has coordinated the work looking at the social, economic and environmental impacts of public sector food procurement, focusing on school meals and looking also at the question of food waste. And then we're going to hear from Adam Wilkinson and Professor Steve Quarry, who have been developing tools for the better management of public sector food procurement. So what we're going to do now is pass over to Professor Angela Tregea, who is going to introduce and take you through the main themes and research findings. So thank you very much, Matt, um, and uh, hello and, and welcome everyone to this um, presentation of the Strengths of Food Research into um, Public uh, Sector Food Procurement. I'm giving this presentation on my own today, but as you can see from this title slide, there was a, a large uh, team of people that were involved in this project and we worked together intensively over um, uh, three years in order to complete the work and so in the time I have available today um, I only can really share some of the highlights of our, uh, of our research with you and um, you can find all of our summaries and full reports um, on the Strength to Food website so please do feel free to, to browse there and, and get the full picture. In terms of um, a bit of background to the research itself, so sustainability has really come to the fore in, in public uh, food procurement over the last decade or so, and as Matt has, has mentioned uh, recently too. And this has prompted shifts in policies and contract designs away from lowest cost oriented types of procurement towards procurement that takes more account of wider environmental, economic and social outcomes of procurement activities. And this is reflected in contracts that, for example, encourage more local sourcing of products, as well as supply of more organically produced food. 
But the question still remains, um, what are in practice the impacts of these different types of procurement approach and procurement model? And it was this core question that really drove our research. So across five countries, we undertook in-depth case studies of 10 um, mail services to primary schools, capturing a mix of low cost oriented um, local sourcing and organic sourcing emphasis in procurement systems. And we um, investigated a, a range of um, issues uh, as highlighted in the, in the questions, um, the research questions uh, listed here. And it's essentially um, the answers to these questions that I'm going to focus on in the presentation um, this morning. And um, just so that you have a, a picture in your head of what the case studies were and where they were located. So they're shown here on this map. And what you can see is that in four of the five countries, UK, Croatia, Serbia and Greece, um, one of the case pairs was a low cost oriented um, a procurement system, a meal service with that, that uh, procurement orientation. And the second uh, case was a, a local um, sourcing emphasis uh, a case where, where local sourcing was, was encouraged and, and was a feature of the, of the meal service. In Italy, where low-cost procurement for school meals is effectively precluded due to regional laws, um, the two cases were uh, an organic um, emphasis procurement uh, system um, and a, a meal service with uh, um, an emphasis on sourcing both local and organic food. So I'm going to move on now to share with you some of the um, key results that we found in relation to the, the impacts of these cases. And I'm going to start by um, sharing with you the results of the, the carbon footprint of these um, uh, 10 case services. And essentially what we were trying to estimate was the total carbon emissions in kilograms of CO2 equivalent for each of the 10 um, meal services, drawing from three main source uh, sources of emissions. First of all, emissions relating to the production and processing of the foods procured and their, their upstream transportation. Secondly, the downstream um, transportation of foods to kitchens or schools. And thirdly, um, emissions associated with the disposal of the food waste from the meal services. And so let me share with you, first of all, then, um, what we found out about which foods the, the 10 case meal services actually procured. And so in this chart here, you have um, the five countries and the 10 uh, uh, meal services um, organised in that way. And each bar shows the um, total weight of food procured per average meal. And the figures above um, each bar show you what that weight was in kilograms. So you can see here, for example, that the Italian cases um, procured the most food per average meal. Um, the colour coding in this chart um, shows you which types of foods were procured and in what proportion. So, for example, the dark green shows the amount of fresh fruit and vegetables that were procured for the average meal. And again, you can see the Italian cases and um, quite a high proportion uh, of the total food procured um, was fresh fruit and vegetables. Um, the dark red um, uh, refers to the amount of fresh meat procured per average meal. And here in the chart, you can see that um, the Greek cases and the Serbian cases both procured relatively high proportions of fresh meat. And within that, quite um, uh, high proportions of red meat. And that's quite significant when it comes to looking at the corresponding carbon emissions, as we will see in the next chart. So in this diagram here, what um, we have is again the five countries and the 10 cases organised um, along the bottom here. But um, now we have a pair of bar charts per case. On the left hand side um, of um, the pair of bar charts, you have the total amount of food procured um, per average meal, exactly the same as there was in the previous bar chart. On the right hand side, the bar, the, the right hand side bar shows the um, corresponding carbon emissions associated with that physical food procurement. 
Um, and what you can see looking across is there's quite a lot of variation in the emissions from the different meal services. If we look at Greece, which is perhaps the most striking um, set of results, you can see that the carbon emissions are more than four times the um, weight of the, the, the physical food procured. And there's two main reasons for that. Um, I should have said, sorry, that um, the, the carbon emission bars contain two extra colours. And those are dark blue that refers to the um, emissions from transportation and the dark grey, which refers to the emissions from waste disposal. Um, and coming back to the Greek case then, we see that um, these have high emissions relative to the other cases, and there's two reasons for this. One is the emissions relating to waste disposal. That's the dark grey areas here, and you can see that they are um, quite a substantial part of the total emissions. And that's because in Greece, all of the um, food from these meal services was disposed of in landfill, which has a high carbon burden. In the other cases, um, a low carbon disposal method was used, such as anaerobic digestion or composting, with um, the result that those emissions are very small. In fact, in Serbia, it was about half landfill, half in low carbon method. So that's why they are, the dark grey is a little bit higher there. The second reason for the Greek, the Greek um, emissions being so high is the proportion of um, uh, fresh meat in the menu and uh, within that the amount of red meat. So you can see that the dark red areas here are again quite a large proportion of the total emissions and that's because red meat uh, carries a, a high carbon burden. You can see the same effect here in the, in the Serbian uh, cases, which again had somewhat uh, higher proportions of fresh meat within that red meat um, uh, in the procurement. In contrast, Italy, which if you recall, procured the, the highest weight of foods per, per average meal, actually has about the lowest emissions. And that's due to the, the combination of um, um, low carbon waste disposal method, um, small amounts of red meat in the menu and um, a high proportion of fresh fruit and vegetables which have a, a low carbon uh, burden. The final thing to note from these results is that when you look across the cases the um, contribution of transport emissions to um, total emissions is, is pretty modest at most 10 to 15 percent so that's the dark blue areas here in each bar and so overall what we conclude from, from um, this part of our, our work is that the carbon emissions and the carbon footprint of these meal services depends more on what is on the menu and how the food is disposed of rather than where the food comes from. So that's um, the main uh, conclusions there. Moving on now to look at um, the results of our um, study of the economic impacts of the meal cases. And here we were interested in studying and understanding how much of the meals budgets ended up staying in the local areas. And we did this by tracking um, how the budgets were spent on staff, catering staff and suppliers, and whether those um, uh, staff and suppliers resided in the local area or not. And then we estimated how much of those staff and suppliers respending of their income um, was uh, spent in the local area or not. And the outcome of this um, analysis was the generation of a, um, a, a ratio known as a local economic multiplier that essentially um, expresses how much of the meals budget generates additional value to the local economy. So let's take a look at what we found. So in this chart here, again, we have the countries in the 10 cases as before. And what the bars show you is what the meals budgets were spent on in, in each of the case services. Um, and the colour coding is such that um, dark colours indicate spending on staff and suppliers in the local area. Light colours indicate spending um, on staff and suppliers not residing in the local area. So for example, you can see that in the Serbian local case, there's lots of dark here. So that shows that a large proportion of that meals budget was spent in the local area. In contrast, if we look at the Greek low case, we see that um, only a small proportion of the budget was spent in the local area.
So we were interested in estimating what that meant for additional value generated in the local area for the local economy um, for each of these cases. And so the next chart I have to show you um, has the same bars as before with the same proportional spends, but then above each bar, we've added in the um, economic multiplier ratio, so um, here. And these ratios are a figure um, from between one, which indicates a small amount of additional value, and three, which indicates a high amount of additional value. And so if we return then here to our Serbian local case with a high amount of local um, spending in the local area, we can see here that it has a ratio, a multiplier ratio of 2.46. And essentially what that means is that for every one euro or equivalent, equivalent currency unit spent from this meal service, um, an additional one um, euro 46 is generated in added value for the local economy. In contrast, um, the Greek case, which as we see had only a small amount of spending in the local area, um, there the ratio is 1.59 and that means that for every one euro spent from this meal service, uh, only an additional 59 cents uh, value is generated for the local area. And so what our results uh, confirm is that um, uh, localised meal services that um, have high proportions of budget spent on local staff and suppliers um, do have positive economic impacts um, for the local area. So that's the economic um, results, economic impact results. Moving on now to look at what we found out about the social impacts of these 10 case meal services. Here, we were interested in um, understanding how good the relations were between the people working in school meals chains and um, catering services. So we interviewed people in the supply chain and in the catering services, asking them about their jobs, about their roles, um, who they spoke to, who they didn't interact with, to try and get a feel for, for, for what was going on in terms of the relations. Very complex and rich picture, as you may well imagine, across the 10 cases. But overall, um, what we found is that the relations generally between supply chain members and between suppliers and schools tended to be stronger in the local oriented um, cases than in the, the low cost cases or, or equivalents. And we had identified numerous advantages about um, increased flexibility and resilience in the supply chains in those cases, as well as knock on um, educational and community vibrancy um, benefits as well coming from that, uh, those stronger relations. However, in the schools, we found more mixed relations between the catering staff in the, in the service and the, and the school staff and teaching staff. And we found that meal services often work somewhat in isolation from the rest of school life, which misses opportunities, as we saw it, for that meal service to be able to contribute to curriculum and extracurriculum activities and benefits. So overall, what we conclude in terms of the social impacts from these case studies is that to maximise the social benefits, it's important to try to develop stronger connections between the suppliers, the meal service and the schools, and to promote a more integrated and valorised role for the catering staff. And I will come back to valorisation um, at the end. So I'm going to move on now in the meantime, though, to um, focus on our results relating to what went on in the school canteens. So looking at what was actually on the menu in these 10 case meal services and how nutritious those meals were. And then also ultimately um, what happened with, uh, with the waste. Um, and I'd just like to point out that um, uh, this part of the work was led by our Croatian team who undertook food composition analysis of samples of daily menus from the 10K services. And both our Croatian team and our Serbian teams um, have continued to be very active in, in carrying on this work beyond the, the end of, of the research. So in terms of what was on the menu, um, I've uh, just uh, grabbed a, a couple of uh, screenshots um, to give you some idea of uh, the kind of dishes that were, were offered in, in the different countries. So we have here Croatia, Serbia, um, Italy, 
and a Greece. Of course, they're all very different, but two common threads. One is that in all of the, these four countries' case meal services, um, uh, there was one uh, daily option, so not one daily course um, meal, meal with one course, but one daily option that all students um, took. And the other thing that, that was interesting about these four countries is that all of the um, dishes had quite a traditional character with no featuring of chips, burgers and, and, and other foods of that sort. This is very interesting from a UK perspective because in our case studies in the UK, as is uh, reflective more widely, um, multiple options are available um, on a daily basis and the menus do include um, foods such as um, burgers and, and chips of course um, offered within a, 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 a nutritional um, a framework and, and, and approval. And speaking of um, nutritional analysis, um, I'd like to share with you um, some of the um, results from that part of the work. So um, it's nutritional analysing a sample of the menus, um, we found that a high proportion of daily menus did meet um, the nutritional standards, the national nutritional standards are equivalent for some nutrients, for example, protein. Um, so apologies, this graph is a little bit on the small side, but basically we have the 10 case studies in each of these bars. And the orange colour coding basically shows the proportion of daily menus in the cases that met the nutritional standards. And you can see that for protein, that's quite a high proportion. However, we did find in relation to other nutrients um, and, and energy, um, many of the daily menus were either deficient or excessive in, um, in, in, in those uh, nutrients. So I've given the example here of carbohydrates. You can see that the blue colour coding shows that um, uh, deficient carbohydrates are, are, are offered in the daily menus, the proportion of menus with that deficiency. Um, so there are some issues there, but importantly, our analysis showed that those the differences are not related to the type of procurement approach or procurement model. Instead, the nutritional composition and nutritional quality of those um, daily menus was more dependent on factors such as the existence of a national standards framework and the um, active implementation of it, and um, actions such as involving professional nutritionists in the menu design, and that was more important. Coming on then to the, the final um, set of results to share with you, and that relate, relates to the um, food waste. Um, and again, this work was led by our creation team, um, and uh, uh, collectively we um, gathered plate waste from a total of 179 lunch services across the, um, the 10 case studies. And what we found, um, and what is shown in the chart here, is the percentage of um, food um, that was served um, in, on the days of uh, collection, uh, plate waste collection, that was uh, collected as, as waste. Um, and you can see that um, there is uh, some variation across the 10 cases there. On average, uh, just under 30% of the food served ended up as plate waste in the samples uh, that, uh, that we looked at. And um, fruit and vegetables and starchy carbohydrates were the most wasted foods, which have implications for nutritional loss, particularly in terms of fibre, um, certain micronutrients, and also energy. So there, there are some, some issues there. Um, plate waste um, also represented about a quarter of the total food budget um, in these case services and a similar proportion of the embodied carbon um, in, the, in the food that was, that was procured. And so reducing food waste um, would, would be a, a very valuable thing to, to address and our um, approach to um, or recommendations for that again not necessarily related to procurement approach and model but rather about looking at what goes on in the in the canteen by valorizing the role of the catering staff in the canteen environment and seeking also to to try and increase the levels of lunchtime supervision and, and support for students these would be the most impactful actions based on our, our canteen observations so that brings me to the, the end of my um, presentation um, and I thank you very much for, for your attention and look forward to answering any questions you might have later on. But for now, I'm going to pass you back to Matt, who's going to introduce the, um, the next part of the um, webinar. Thanks, Angela. 
Uh, so what we're going to do now in the next part of the webinar is move on to looking at two tools which are being developed as part of Strength to Food on public sector food procurement. So the first tool is the Food Analyzer, which is being developed by Adam Wilkinson and the colleagues at Edinburgh. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Adam Wilkinson. My company is called Impact Measurement Limited. We're a non-academic partner in the Strength to Food program, and we've been working with Edinburgh University to develop this food impact tool that I'm going to talk about today. This has arisen directly from the research that has been carried out on the program in five different European countries, in particular looking at primary school and primary school supply chains and food services. What we wanted to do is to use that research to create a tool that would be of practical value for procurement and food service providers. And in doing so, that would be helpful on a policy level to inform both change and actually the direction of policy as well. So we hope we've achieved that. And today I want to take you through quickly a little bit about what's required to make the tool work and what it might mean for you. So how does it work? The first stage is that we need some information from the user, you, about your meals and your menus and your requirements. And in doing so, we've tried to ask for the bare minimum of information. We tried to make it in a form which will be easy for you to acquire and to put into the system. And that's quite important to us because we want it to make it as easy as possible. But equally, we have to make sure we have enough information to make the results credible. As soon as that information is put in, the tool will calculate what your total carbon footprint is from the food service and also which parts of the procurement contribute the most emissions. And we break that down and we also look at things like plate waste as it's an important part and it's a separate part and we can calculate the public value as well. And to do the public value and the economic impacts, we're using a model called LM3. Uh, but we're going to keep clear of that generally today as it, as it would require more explanation than we have time for. Uh, but we can always talk about it in the questions and answer session afterwards if you wish. The final part of the tool looks at some what-if scenarios where we've made some suggestions about how change might be implemented to the food procurement. And they're fairly simple in their scope, at least to describe, but it means that we can also calculate what the impact of those changes might be. And the aim with this is to give you a sort of pathway about to suggest how you might improve in the future so we hope we find this we hope you're going to find this useful we'd encourage you to use the tool yourself after the demonstration you can see the address to download it or to register for it at the top of the screen here and we'll show it again at the end when you arrive at the data entry page you'll find that the page is divided into sections which reflect the different parts of the procurement that we need to know about to do the calculations. In the first section you'll see the food categories, and you can see these down the left hand side. And what we ask you to do is to show one week's weight of each food category by percentage. So currently red meat is showing as 11% and other meat at 7% and so on down. But you can see the total at the bottom is showing 105%. And obviously we need to make that work to 100. So we can reduce the red meat by, say, 6%. And now we have 100 at the bottom. So you can just play with these until you've got the results correct. And once you're happy with that, you can move on to the next stage. Here, what we're really interested in is knowing a bit more about the meal uh, that you're serving, again, for an, for an average week. So here there's the average meal weight in grams, that's 490, it's actually quite high. We could make that say 400 grams and you can move on down and make any changes you like. It's worth just noticing here that we're asking you for the number of weeks that you produce in the year. At the moment that's set at 52, which is obviously every week. That's useful for things like hospitals or prisons or anywhere which does that kind of thing or indeed private sector caterers. Uh, but a fairly typical school meal um, would be, say, 38 weeks a year. And again, you can change any of those. 
The next stage is to ask you a bit more about the environment. And we're interested here in particular about waste. So we'd like you to tell us what you estimate, what percentage of food you estimate is plate waste every week. And we're, we're aware this is probably the most difficult figure for people to estimate, uh, unless they've done some work on this specifically. And if you really can't, then we can use a default value within the system uh, for you. But we'd say do your best. And for the moment it's set to 30, which we will leave. And then we, can, we also ask you for saying, how do you dispose of that waste? And there are currently two options here. One is digester and the other is landfill. This does make quite a big difference to the, to the outcome. So, so try and get that one right if you can. The last section, which I, I'm not going to dwell on now, is asking you about the financial impacts of your, your meal service. And this, this enables us to calculate your local economic impact, or at least to give an indicator. I will just show you that at the main moment the slide is of 100 and the bar is green. If any of the bits of information or the sliders on the page are, are actually not adding up, this bar at the bottom will turn red and you won't be able to submit the page. So just make sure it's green. And once it's green, you can submit the results and you're immediately taken to the results screen. The first graph that you're going to see when you re reach the results page is this one. And this is showing a comparison between the food weight that you purchased and the carbon emissions, the impact of that food weight has generated. The graph, the other thing to notice is that we've changed this. So we're now showing this data on a per annum basis, although that's also broken down and I'll show you that in a second. On the left hand side of the graph, we have the food weight by kilograms. And on the right hand side, we're showing the carbon. So you can see a direct visual comparison between the two impacts or the two, two quantities. And down on, the, on this axis, we have the various categories of food for which you entered information earlier in the tool. If we hover over any of the lines on the graph, you can see the quantitative data that lies behind the graph. And in this case, for example, you can see that we entered 6% by food weight of red meat, and that's generated 27% of the carbon emissions, total carbon emissions. So a very significant figure, and, and visually that shows that too, with a very small area to the left and a very big area to the right. By contrast, if we go down to, say, fruit and vegetables, you can see that the weight of food by percentage that we, that we purchased was 51%, but that 51% has only generated 24% of the emissions, so a big difference between the two. As we go further down, we can see there are two additional categories in here. One is the disposal. And again, if you float over, you can see the disposal. In this case, it's only 1% because we were using, um, we were using a digester rather than landfill. But if you look at the bottom, you can see all that where we've summarized the key points. You can see that waste disposal is 1.1% of your total emissions. But if you had been using landfill, it would be 22.7%. So we're giving you some additional information and comparison information below. And finally, transport uh, is worth saying a word about in, the, in that um, although it's significant, it's by no means the most significant of the results. And I think, I think for a long time we've heard quite a lot about food miles. And I'm, I'm not suggesting we ignore them completely, but there are other things that we might concentrate on if we wish to, um, to make bigger differences quicker. Uh, and this very much is, is one of the key findings of the research. And, and obviously what this tool is doing is mirroring those patterns in research and matching them against your data. And this is what we see happening here. Finally, before I move on, the, on any of these tabs, you can see there's a, a, another link at the bottom of, and which will take you to a document which shows exactly how these carbon emissions have been calculated. So the tool is completely transparent in that sense. When we move to the second slide, we're really concentrating here on what the effect of your plate waste is on the system. And we've divided that again into two different halves. On the left hand side, we're showing you what the financial impact of that food that's being thrown away is. And, and in this particular example, we can say that it's cost you something just over 28,000 euros a year, just in discarded value of food thrown away, which is a it's really a pretty big figure, I think. 
And on the right hand side, we're showing you what the embodied carbon of that food that you've thrown away is. Now, I just want to make the point here that this doesn't include the carbon cost of waste disposal. That's simply the carbon accumulated in the food uh, in its production, delivery and, and, and um, preparation. And again, it's showing you what the difference between the, the two halves of this is. So it, it is important, and plate waste is a very significant factor here, which we, we'll look at a bit more in, in a minute. The third area is a comparison area. Uh, now, at the moment, this is not working fully, and I'll explain why in a minute. However, what we're showing as, as sort of good base benchmark comparators is what the total emissions in carbon per meal are for each meal and what the total emissions per kilogram of food procured is over the whole of the procurement program. And you can see that these two values are displayed here. However, what we're not able to show yet is what the average for your sector is. Uh, and the reason for that is very simple in that we have not made this tool at all public yet. This is the first time it's been made publicly available in any sense. And so we can't show comparative data until you go away and use it and we start accumulating the comparative data. As you do that, it's very much our, our intention to start showing how your sector compares as against your peers in that sector, which might help you to know how well or badly you're doing. Uh, so we hope that will find that useful, but when and when if it that arrives, that's entirely under your control, not ours. Finally, I want to look very briefly at the economic impact element of the tool. Uh, we've, we've stayed away from it because it, it requires more explanation. However, uh, what we're showing here as a headline is that the total value to the local economy of this whole procurement is 3.8 million euros. And that for every euro spent, that generates one pound, one euro 92 within your local economy. So again, what we're looking at here is not just the economic impact, but also some of the socioeconomic impacts as well. That takes us really to the last part of the tool, which tries to suggest to you four pretty straightforward ways in which you might think about improving your outcomes. And we try to take one from each sort of section of the tool to help you guide, guide through this. And you can switch these off or on as you desire, and you'll see that at the bottom, the impacts are calculated and totaled as required. If you want to achieve the maximum public value benefit, this is not pure euros in that sense, but it is public value, then the way to do it is by spending 10% more locally, and that puts an additional 183,000 euros into your local economy. But you can see that the biggest single saving, if you're interested in the carbon side in particular, is to change the digester where you'll save, change to digester from landfill, where you can save 32,000. Of course, if you're already doing that, you can switch that off. It may be worth looking at the sort of this element as well, which is that the most effective sort of dual action is in fact to reduce your plate waste by 10%. And we talked earlier about um, how about the impacts of plate waste. And, and really that addresses both sides at the same time. So, thank you very much for your attention. I, I hope you've felt that it's given you some idea of what's going on with this tool and whether and how it might be of use to you. Uh, I do want to emphasize this is a fully working proof of concept prototype. Um, so it's not the final and finished completed article but we do feel that it's in a position to give you useful and credible information about your food procurement. You can see the download address link here. And if you go there, you can simply register, uh, which is a very simple process indeed. It's really about putting in your sector so we can do the sector comparisons later. Uh, and do use the tool. And please do come back to either myself or to Angela if you've got any comments, queries, suggestions, um, or want to have a discussion in general, we're, we're very keen to, to, to listen to people at this stage because I think that's quite important. So thank you very much for your attention and I'll hand you back for the remainder of the webinar. Thanks, Adam. 
So we're now going to move on to the second tool, which is a complementary tool, which has been developed by Professor Steve Quarry. Hello, and thanks, Matt, for the introduction. So, Steve Quarry, Head of Education and Training at the European Training Academy in Belgrade, Serbia, and I shall now describe the Strength to Food Meal Planner, an Excel tool developed specifically to meet the needs of schools that we're working with in Serbia. But first, I need to give a bit of background information to explain why this tool was developed. Unlike most European countries, the large majority of primary schools in Serbia that give meals to their children, they have to carry out their own food procurement. So each year the school has to tender for its year's supply of food, either as ready-made meals provided externally, or as food ingredients for the school to make its own meals. On the Strength to Food project, we are working only with schools that make their own meals. Another difference between Serbian primary schools and those of many other European countries is that schools here can provide any combination of up to four meals per day. So breakfast, morning snack, lunch and afternoon snack. Now although kindergartens have their own nutritionists who advise on meal composition to ensure nutritional balance, very few primary schools have nutritionists, so maintaining a suitable nutritional balance for their meals is challenging and most meal recipes are put together either according to the cook's experience or recipes from the, area, from the era when schools could afford nutritionists and these recipes are just copy-pasted from one year to the next. So the nutritional quality of most school meals is, or at least was, unknown. Because of this, in September 2018, the Ministry of Education in Serbia introduce the country's first regulations governing the nutritional quality of primary school meals, with recommendations on macro and nutrient quantities per day. So, this Excel meal planner has been developed specifically for these schools to give them information on the nutritional quality of their meals, the cost of each meal, and to take advantage of Strength to Food's findings on the level of food plate waste in Serbian schools, as well as CO2 emissions during food production, the meal planner also uses plate waste to calculate the typical nutritional intake from each meal, which means how much the children actually eat, as well as the meal's carbon footprint. So, let's move on to demonstrate how the meal planner works. And just a moment while I set up screen sharing so you can see the Excel spreadsheet. So, here we have the meal planner. As you can see at the bottom, it has seven spreadsheets, instructions, ingredient prices, meal entry week one, week two, charts and graphs, recommendations, and finally, the quantities of food items. And it starts with some general background information here, sources of information that are used by the software, spreadsheet information, and then instructions on meal entry followed by explanation of the outputs that are provided by the meal planner. Let's go now to ingredient prices. These are entered by the school and in brown, the columns here, these come directly from the procurement documentation and in gray, those columns come from the contract from the supplier. Here we have nice foods in Cyrillic Serbian which are converted into English by the software in the meal planner on the left-hand side. The total quantities during the year are here on the, on the right-hand side. And prices, unit prices without VAT, the rate of VAT with VAT, and total prices for the year. So let's move on to entering the food for each of the meals now. So here we have meal entry for week one and a number of columns that the school has to fill in. The first over here is a description of the meal that is provided for the parent. The next one here is the number of children that are provided with that particular meal. So let's say 100 children. Then a description of the meal courses, for example, soup, toast or whatever. Then the next one is selecting the food category. And you can see from the drop-down list here that we have various food categories. 
let's select vegetables. And then once that's been selected, you can select a particular vegetable, let's say white cabbage. And finally, you enter the weight for that particular ingredient. And on the right hand column, you'll see it is now calculated in kilograms, the total weight of cabbage that's required for that particular meal. So that's for breakfast. Then we have over here snack one in the morning and lunch and finally snack two in the afternoon. Then we move on to Tuesday and after Tuesday, as you might expect, Wednesday, Thursday and Friday. So that's the first week and it's exactly the same for week two. Here you see we start off with breakfast and so on. So let's now move on to the charts and graphs. So once all the meal ingredients have been entered, then you get some output. And the first page of outputs is shown here. And up at the top, you can select week one or week two. So this is at the moment week one. You can also select the conventional vegetable prices or organic vegetable prices. Here we have a table of some basic information on the nutrients, macronutrients and micronutrients. This is the amount given to the children in actual milligrams or grams. Then we have the recommended quantity according to the ministry's instructions. And then finally taking account of plate waste and you can see the average for this day of typical food waste is around 27%. So that information is now taking account of the plate waste. So then we have bar charts. The first bar chart is the total that's given to the children for lunch as a percent of recommended in the ministry guidelines. The second is the lunch that's actually eaten by the children, again, percent recommended. Then uh, we've got at the bottom here, some more charts. Here we have cumulative costs of the food categories per meal. So that's the cost in green of vegetables. Uh, yellow is uh, fruit. Then we have blue is fresh meat and so on. Here we have the total weight that's given. And on the right hand side, this is the CO2 emissions for each of the food ingredients. Moving down to the pie charts at the bottom, this is now breaking down each meal into its food categories. So here we have the total cost of vegetables, cost of fruit, the cost of fresh meat. Over here we have the weight of vegetables per meal, the weight of fruit per meal, the weight of meat per meal, and on the right hand side their equivalents in CO2 emissions. So this is week one, I can now change this to week two and you'll see the results of entering the data for week two. These are for lunch. And this is the amount of uh, vegetables and the cost of vegetables at conventional prices. If I now change to organic, you'll see that the cost of the vegetables will go up. So, here we now have the, the cost for the vegetables. So that's that chart. Let's move on to the next one, recommendations. Again, we have the table of uh, values on the left-hand side, but on the right-hand side, you can now see information on recommendations and information for the children and for the school and their parents on what they've been eating. So at the top, it summarizes basic information on the main ingredients for the meals. And here it says there is insufficient calories per day, insufficient carbohydrates, insufficient protein, insufficient fat, but sufficient fiber in the meals. Then after that general information, here you can see some cells are in shades of red. That indicates that those particular minerals over here or vitamins down here, they are deficient for that particular meal. So where they are deficient, I've provided a list of the major foods which are high in those minerals or vitamins so that either the school cook or the parents can supplement the children's diet with those extra ingredients to overcome any weaknesses in the nutrients. We have further details down here of different types of information for the parents. And finally, we have individual meals. This is breakfast. 
morning snacks, recommended lunches, and then finally for each day of the week, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, so on. The final spreadsheet is information on the quantities of food that have been used for week one and also for week two. So this is the, the ranked ingredients and their quantities in kilograms or liters, the number of units that the school has bought, the, the unit measure VAT, so this is the price plus VAT, this is the, the total cost of that, this is the lot, in this case these are pastries from one supplier, and then lot two is everything else from another supplier. So that's week one, and that is week two. So that is a brief overview of the Excel meal planner and from this demonstration you can see that the meal planner tool is very different in its concept and operation from the meal analyzer that was described a few minutes earlier though in many respects the two are complementary. So that's it and thanks for watching. Okay thank you Steve. Um, I appreciate that we're running out of time so that some people may want to leave, but we'll try and take a few questions now and we'll also try and answer those questions when we uh, give you feedback and links to the recording. So if we have a look at the question and answer, we have a question from Julia about how is local defined across the case studies? I don't know if Angela would like to answer this. Yes, thank you. Um, we uh, had to think quite hard about the, the definition of local for obvious reasons and in the end we decided that it would be better to um, choose a, a definition of local that made sense in respect to um, the individual case studies rather than to have a single measure across all cases. So, um, uh, uh, for example, in, um, in, in a UK context, in a, an Italian context, um, a, a radius from the, um, from the kitchen or, or, or schools um, of around 30 to 40 kilometres was the, 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 the benchmark of, of, of local. Whereas in um, a Serbian context, where individual schools um, are responsible for their, for their own procurement um, and the um, configuration of the supply chains in that country, um, the, um, the radius of local was smaller than that. Um, and it was purely to try and um, uh, respond to the fact that we needed to be talking about local in a way that made sense to the, the stakeholders involved in the meal services rather than to impose a, um, a, a blanket a definition. Thanks, Angela. We've got a, a sort of related question from Peter Sampson. So thank you, Peter, for joining us. Um, are the nutritional standards that are specified locally or are they a common standard across the case studies, so for the nutritional work? Mm. So again, yes, thank you very much for the, for the question, um, uh, Peter. And um, the short answer to the question is that we um, applied um, national um, nutritional standards, again, rather than trying to um, impose a, a single um, set of nutritional standards across all countries when um, uh, countries have different uh, nutritional priorities and different contexts that they're dealing with in children's nutrition. Um, so we applied what the, the national standards where for any context where there weren't any national standards in place at the time of the data collection, we used the um, uh, World Health, Health Organization um, uh, nutritional standards as a proxy. Thanks, Angela. Uh, we've got a question about uh, from Henk. Uh, thank you for joining us. So do you have any suggestions for smart tenders which not lead to the cheapest offer? But offer the best against multiple criteria. I don't know if Adam would like to talk about this. Yes, uh, thank you Matt and uh, Hank, uh, this is a bit of a, a tricky area to talk about quickly but yes I do, in fact when I very first did this sort of work on food and food procurement a very long time ago in the north of England we did include within the tender process um, from within OGU uh, criteria on uh, improving impacts on local economies 
And uh, one could do the same, I think, now with this tool on carbon. And in fact, that's part of what I had in mind when I was, when I was thinking about the tool and, and how it might be developed. Uh, the sensible place to put it, I suspect, is um, as a non-quantifiable non criteria within the tender process. Um, but if one had within the tender itself uh, objectives such as reducing carbon impact or improving local economic impact, then it would be perfectly reasonable to use these kind of um, criteria within the tender itself. Uh, the issue, of course, is that this would be ahead of the tender. And um, if you made it a qualifying criteria, you'd probably need to put some, some kind of measurement function in place to see whether that was actually delivered later on. Uh, but then that's true of any criteria, really. Uh, I hope that helps a bit anyway. Thanks, Adam. Um, there are a few questions which are factual questions, which I think may be best if we just respond to those through um, the follow-up written one. But there's a question from Kevin Morgan, um, I think mainly for Angela, saying, could something be said about how schools were governed? So is it by local authorities or autonomous as in England? And what was the take-up rate of school meals? E.g. was it all children or a percentage of children? Because this is critical to the financial viability of the service. So thanks, Kevin, for the question. Yes, um, yeah, it's a, it's a very good question and um, unfortunately didn't have time to, to talk about the way in which the, um, the school meal services were, were organised and, and governed, so I'll say a quick word about that now. Um, essentially, they were, they were very mixed in the governance, um, so um, uh, as you, you've said, uh, in, in England it's a mixed picture and that schools can, can opt out in, from local authorities um, a, a delivery meal service and to, to undertake the procurement um, uh, autonomously and that is in fact uh, the normal model in, in Croatia and, and, and Serbia. Um, there is also as well the, a difference in governance in terms of whether the uh, meal service is um, funded in, in, uh, and, and uh, delivered in-house by the school or by the local authority directly or whether there is a, um, a, a it is contracted out to, to private caterers. I think um, one observation that I would make about the effect of the governance in a structure or in a administrative um, approach to, to the meal service and um, its impact is that um, our evidence from the from the Serbian um, cases and to a certain extent the Croatian cases as well is that when schools are undertaking their own procurement it does place a heavy burden on the um, the school the school managers who are you know, multitasking often and, and don't necessarily have the time and space and resource to be able to um, think about um, changing um, practices it does seem to um, sometimes lead to a situation where um, a, a, the, the, the procurement responsible in the school will, will, will kind of do what they've always done. Um, I, I look to Steve in some senses for, for, uh, for corroboration of this, but that's, that certainly was a, 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 a something that, that came through from the, from the Serbian report. So governance does certainly have, a, have an impact on, on the way in which the um, people involved in decision making approach um, the, the, the challenges that we have and the way we see those challenges. Thanks Angela. Um, I know uh, quite a few people need to leave and I'm getting sort of messages about that so maybe if we just take one more question now and then we'll try and deal with the other questions later. So um, I want to do ask a question because there's one specifically for Steve and the tool about what lessons do you think from the work in Serbia has emerged in terms of how procurement could be organized? Oh, that's an interesting one. I could talk for hours about that, but I appreciate that I don't have the time available. Um, it's a very complex uh, story about procurement in Serbia. And we are working with schools to try to identify opportunities for making changes to their procurement system. Uh, at least their procurement doc documentation. Unfortunately, our work is going to be um, affected by a new procurement law which comes in on the 1st of July. And this is going to result in quite a few changes in the way that documents are submitted. So all of the preliminary work that we've been doing with schools to persuade them to split their procurement 
into several lots rather than have everything as a single lot, which is what a lot of schools are doing at the moment, so that uh, small producers can bid for individual types of food. It looks as if all of this is going to be started again once the new procurement law starts at the beginning of, of July. So at the moment, uh, we're in a, a hiatus because no Serbian schools are, are functioning. Although behind the scenes, we are still in discussion with a few of the school directors, uh, particularly about the introduction of organic food. And this is something that we've, uh, we've established is, is realistic for schools to consider because on an annual basis, in including organic vegetables instead of um, conventional vegetables, it has an impact on their budget of only around five to six percent over the year. And by modifying their their menus, we can uh, we can account for that five percent by making savings elsewhere, mainly in the amount of meat that the schools are using. So it is possible to make changes in the procurement. Um, foods that schools are using at the moment, but everything has become complicated by the new law. So, hmm, maybe yes. if you want to discuss that afterwards, you can contact me later and we can have further exchange. Thanks, Steve. And I know that you are interested in developing the tool for other contexts and trying to make it available to people and working with other contracting authorities outside of Serbia who may be interested in developing the tool for their particular circumstances and specifics? Well, certainly what I was showing you was the English version of a tool that was originally developed uh, entirely in Serbian for Serbian foods using the, the Serbian food nutritional standards, which happen to be based on the WHO nutritional standards. So uh, the actual software could easily be translated into any other language, provided that there is a nutritional database This is relevant for that country and that language. So it's a case of uh, translating into the relevant language. Thanks, Steve. I'd like to thank everyone who's joined us today for the questions which you asked, which we'll try and deal with later. I'd like to thank our presenters. I hope that you found it useful. I'd like to thank Carlos for arranging all the um, administrative and technical issues. So from the team at the Strength to Food Project, I say thank you very much and goodbye.